<laughs> feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, TheRockNHCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Our own Mike Rogers reported this week that Senator Ted Cruz got the big get for Republican primary candidates in Iowa. I'm referring to the endorsement of the CEO of the family leader, Bob Vanderplatz. It's a great day here in the state of Iowa, and we're thrilled to be putting our support behind Senator Ted Cruz. I, I, well, I really believe he has the opportunity to unite conservatives, not only in Iowa, but across this country. Uh, he's a man of great principle. He has a titanium spine. I think people see him as a serious leader, someone who's willing to take on both sides of the aisle, but really to cast a, a vision of bold leadership for this country. And I think that's why you're seeing the uptick in the polls already in Iowa. And we're just hoping to add fuel to that to that fire. And so Ted Cruz is not the guy who's going to go to D.C. to go along, to get along, say, with John McCain and, and Schumer and others. But he's going to go to Washington, D.C. to make a difference, and that's to represent the people of this country. It is a nod that has significant sway in the state, which, unlike New Hampshire, has more evangelicals than you can shake a stick at. Cruz was already ahead of Trump in Iowa in at least one poll. With less than two months to the caucus, those numbers will likely improve. The Vanderplatz endorsement has elevated likely nominees to victory in that state in the past two cycles, and since 1976, the winner of either Iowa or New Hampshire, with one exception, has won their party's nomination. Meanwhile, in New Hampshire, the first official primary state, a recent poll shows Donald Trump in the lead with Governor Christie in second place. The WBUR poll tapped 402 likely voters about their preferences. No other poll yet shows Christie with this much popularity in the Granite State, but the Rhino endorsement rollout we've been chronicling in New Hampshire as moderate luminaries like Ted Bradley and Sherm Packard back the governor is having some impact, clearly drawing support away from the Lost Boys, milling at the bottom of the pack, and uniting the party before principal crowd behind a standard bear. Coming up today on the program, we've got some folks from New Jersey who will share some unpleasant truths about gun rights in that state and how after years under Governor Christie's leadership, citizens are still being denied their constitutional rights. You want to know why the American people are frustrated. You want to know why they're ticked off. You want to know why they cannot understand. It's not that we keep losing elections. That would be frustrating. But you could understand. We've got to do a better job. We've got to motivate people. We've got to convince people. We've got to get a message that resonates. We keep winning. And the people we elect don't do what they said they would do. Steve McDonald here. Ever notice how some Democrats get all worked up about photo ID? No, not the ID you use to access all those government services like unemployment, Social Security, welfare, and even Obamacare. I'm talking about photo ID to vote. And I don't think it's the photo part. Democrats love photos. President Obama's got a real nice one of himself with that pretty Danish prime minister he took while his wife Michelle was sitting right next to him scowling. So if it's not the photo, it must be the ID. But the only reason to object to the ID would be if you were either not who you said you were, or you didn't live where you said you lived. Which might explain why some Democrats get so upset when you ask for one. I say some Democrats, because almost 60% of registered Democrats and 75% of all registered voters thought voter ID was a good idea. So if it's not New Hampshire residents, or even Democrats who oppose voter ID, must be the kind that can't get elected unless they can get people to vote in your town who have no business voting there. This is Steve McDonald for Granite Rock. And we'll keep shining the light on them for you. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk.
Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, heart-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Hey, it is Saturday, December 12th, 2015. Welcome to Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com, New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site. That would make this the New Hampshire's leading conservative podcast. I like this. I can make you go up and down on the camera. What? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm like... I got Have you only just found I... that skip? If you only just found that, I've been no, using that for I think a year. he's just discovered right now that he wants to fidget with something and... Why not fidget with that? So anyway, as always, Spoiler we have guests comments. coming. Uh, <laughs> Alex Rubian from uh, New Jersey Second Amendment Society will be joining us via phone along with Dan Francisco. Yes, that is his name. Uh, to talk about New Jersey gun rights or the lack thereof, and mostly the lack thereof. Don Ewing is going to visit us to talk about Muslim terrorism. He's on the plate uh, for 930, and uh, we'll have an interesting conversation about that. It's a very current topic. And uh, right now we have... New Hampshire Right to Life. Uh, Jane Cormier has joined us along with their new VP, Jennifer Robidell. Yes. Hi. How are you? Good, Good morning. How are you? Howdy. Welcome morning. to the Nut House. <laughs> it's a nice Nut House. It's though. a nice Nut House. Yes. We try to do nice Nut Housey things. <laughs> so, um, Jane, introduce your 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 colleague, okay. and let's talk about some life issues. Jen Robidoux, she's she's been active in pro life here in New Hampshire for five six years. Active, right? Uh, Three, four. Three or four. Yeah. Okay. Well, she she spearheaded the uh, 40 Days for Life last year? Uh, last, last fall. Last fall, yeah. right? And um, she was wonderful with that. I mean, she's a great life spokesperson and uh, speaks from the heart and has a deep faith. And I can't imagine that New Hampshire Right to Life could have a better folk, better person um, sitting in the VP seat. So well, thank she, you. Oh, you're welcome. We we just had our elections last month, so she's a newbie, and yeah. we're kind of showing her the ropes. Um, New Hampshire Right to Life has an awful lot going on. We of course have those three sections of the committee that that sort of spearheads a little bit of everything: the educational trust, which handles just educational events, and then the PAC, which we're gearing up because we're going to have teeth this year. Can you imagine that? Teeth, oh, real teeth. I have a. A favor to ask both of you. Yeah. Can both of you slide down just a little bit? <laughs> because he, he's, my he's head's blocking, blocking your yeah. head. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have yeah, a new, right. ca- I have a new camera, but I realize that it's not going to work on this system. I have to get one of those USB <laughs> aligners. Okay. Was that, that for fun? me? That was, you were punching me in my big head. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Look at the size of that noggin on him. No. I'm blocking an entire person with my head. S- All right. Skip would not, would not say that. He might. I did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He, I, can, I, I have radio proof of okay. how often this happens. All right. <laughs> not every week because we don't have everybody in that chair. Any, so. yes. It's so, just a matter of perspective, Steve. You have to be close to the camera. Okay. I guess the question we should ask, uh, Jen, is um, what brought you to the life movement? And is this a recent thing or has it been something that you've always... Um, well, I've always been ca- uh, pro-life, um, raised Catholic, and uh, but I've never been really active in the pro-life movement um, until about four years ago. Um, a friend of mine invited me to the New Hampshire Right to Life banquet, and while there I met a few people, and then um, my friend Lydia was uh, asked to uh, help uh, coordinate the 40 Days for Life campaign, and she went, Jen, can you help me? So I got dragged into that and then been doing pro-life work ever since. So I thank my friend Lydia um, Shaw for, for dragging me into the pro-life movement. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have somebody drag you in. I um, I came to the political, political activism kind of on my own, but uh, I had some help. You know, um, when I started blogging... Um, Jane Aiken discovered my blog and then dragged me into CNHT and then I found myself on a radio show and then I found myself on a, on a state blog and then eventually I ended up here 
So it's an, it's an interesting. That's why I ask because everybody's journey sits a little bit different as far as how they be how they go from becoming somebody who is just kind of has some ideas and is sort of paying attention to somebody who people are actually listening to on occasion or or <laughs> or, um, or hurling uh, vexing expletives at and you know oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just a different transition. You're like, how did you go from not knowing a lot about politics to being completely? Uh, embroiled in it and you know because i i talk to people about this stuff and they're like i don't know how you do it i'd kill myself it's so depressing all the stuff that's going on and i'm Notice like that. i'm like yep. it, it just takes a little while to get past that stage where you're like oh my god oh my god and then you're like yeah yeah whatever <laughs> <laughs> this is what i gotta do this is who i gotta talk to you know so yeah. it's true true about journeys i mean it's so ironic i wake up some mornings and i just wonder how i ended up where i am my entire life since five was in, in thoroughly engrossed in singing and performing, and that did not change until about five and a half years ago. That was a fact of my life. There was nothing else. I ate, slept, drink, singing, opera singing, performing, teaching, coaching, con- conducting anything. And then you stood in front of that bus. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, I ended up in front of that bus, which almost was? by accident. Um, well, it was the Values bus, I Ouch. think, yep. um, from I forget what it was, Heritage or. Some group that did a tour with buses through the you know the uh, cities of the, the country, and they would get local people come and speak in front about you know life and stuff. But um, truly, the only reason I ended up here was because in my community in Alton, my representative, when I woke up, because I never looked at politics, never, never. Um, when I woke up and looked what he had been voting for. I was astonished, and I thought, how could that happen? I started talking to people and asking how Peter Bolster, who was a pastor at our local, at the largest church in Alton, could be supporting abortion, supporting all of the things that the Republican platform's not supposed to be doing. And you know what? I just got really angry about it. I really did. I was very angry. And then I started to hear that he was actually telling people in the community was actually verbalizing that he knew he could not win in Alton as a Democrat, so he ran as a Republican. And at that moment, something went off in my head, and I said, you know what, I'm going to run against him. And I had not a wit, I'm telling you, not an iota of experience to jump on. It was just total hubris in my part to, to do it. But it shows that one person can make a difference, huh? and that's what it really comes down to. One person, especially in this state of New Hampshire, yeah, the small population where a lot of people know a lot of other people, where the cost to entry of politics is extremely low, yeah, it shows that you can make a difference. Right, you're absolutely right. So you know, we had the one term in the state house, and then we tried the Senate, but I ended up, I think, in the niche I'm supposed to be in, which is um, trying to help with the messaging. And the dialogue happening within life here in New Hampshire. So let's kind of yeah, talk about journey. So, Jen, what's coming up since you're the VP now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, next Saturday, um, se- uh, December 19th, um, we will be having an empty manger Christmas caroling day mm-hmm. um, in Concord um, in front of the Feminist Health Center from 10 to 11 a.m. <laughs> and I can tell you right off the bat, I do not sing. So... Uh, and Jane does. <laughs> so Jane and her friends will be singing. But I invite anyone to come and sing with us, even if you have the worst voice like I do, um, because we need to be um, singing about the joy of Christmas in front of the abortion center, bringing that joy to them. Um, the w- We also will have an empty manger, which will symbolize not only um, the anticipation of the the coming of Christ in the manger but also the anticipation of um the the birth of all those babies um of those women going into the clinic and how we we should be joyful and celebrating those births and not looking at them as problems Mm -hmm. um and it's a national um campaign a national uh singing campaign um so we're, we're joining in our voices with um, the rest of the country. Right. 
I was kind of surprised to find out that this there was one community that was doing this for like four or five years, and then I think it's Pro Life America or, or I forget. I think the, so. Some point some Pro Life America jumped on a couple of years ago and took it national, and there are pockets all over the country that are going to be active. You know, with this one, I think it's ten. What time is it? Ten to eleven a.m. Very, you know, very easy. One hour, ten to eleven next Saturday in front of the uh, the again. What Fem- is the feminist feminist health center? Feminist health in center. Concord. And wh- where is the address? Or what is the address? Oh, <laughs> it's um. We can look it up. It's on South Main Street. Yes, it's on South Main Street. Uh, it's probably a block <clears throat> away from Pleasant Street. That's down the road from here. Right downtown Concord. You can't. We're miss- at the corner of Pleasant and. Correct. North Main. We are North Main, so it's we are North Main. Then Pleasant South Main's turns on in. the other side of the That's street. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. So it's about one block from Pleasant Street. It's and a stone's throw from where we are. Right it now. is. It is. Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, afterwards, we'll have um, hot chocolate and, and Christmas cookies. So y- yeah, you win in both yeah, ends, yeah. right? Show right. up for the hot chocolate and cookies. Learn something. Exactly. There yeah. you go. Right, you. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you? No, no. I just said terrific. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So you're a Catholic. I am. I, I'm a Catholic. Yep. Um, uh, confirmed Catholic, all that. My parents were Catholic. So there's a lot of Catholics who support abortion. Um, and I know there's a lot of Catholics who are kind of in between on that Mm -hmm. fence. So what would, what do you say, what's your strategy for talking to people of your faith, of your, of your denomination who have no idea how to take a stand on abortion or even if they want to? Um, a lot of the um, the reasoning that I hear from people is that, well, my faith is my business, and I don't want to tell people what to do. Um, and I just look at it and say, well, okay, that, that's great, except for the fact that we're dealing with another human person. And so I always look and try to get them to understand that, you know, from the moment of conception, it's a, n- a new life, another person, and we need to be defending all people, um, and we need to be loving and caring to all people. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I tell them, you know, I'll be happy to talk with them about it, um, to give them information, but um, I also tell them I will pray for them and keep them, um, you know, in my prayers and, and uh help them understand what the Catholic Church really teaches. Because a lot of them, you know, just either don't know or don't care. (laughs) Okay, quick break. Be right back. Stay there. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out? CNHT.org. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out? CNHT.org. Rock Talk brought to you by GraniteRock.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers coming to you live almost every week from 8 North Main Street, just a stone's throw from the Feminist Healthcare Center and the Concord State House right up the street from us. We'd like to remind you that we will be here next week, but the Saturday after Thanksgiving, ah, uh, Thanksgiving, we weren't here already. I did that. The Saturday after Christmas and the Saturday after New Year's, we will not be here. So two weeks off for us. Uh, I'll throw up some old audio and you guys will have something to listen to, but we're taking a vacation. Yay. Yay! And the question came up: Where? What is the address of the Feminist Health Center? It is 38 South Main Street. Thank Yay you. for Google! Thank you. Thank so, you. So yeah, you're you're very prescient. You read my mind. I literally was going to ask you: Do we have a show? 
I originally was going to do one on the second, but I'm like, wait a minute, it's the second. I'm not doing a show on the second. Yeah. <laughs> well, come on, your hangover doesn't normally last 48 hours. Oh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't drink enough to get a hangover. I learned that lesson a really long time ago. I know some people never learn it, but yeah. I did. So there's some hope. As we get older, I think that we understand, you know, that wasn't always so fun. Well, the first problem is, you know, once I started having kids, I was like, I, I can't be without my faculties. Mm-hmm. Ever. Because yeah. they're never without theirs. You know, unless it's, <laughs> right, unless it's, exactly, unless I have pneumonia and I'm bedridden or yeah. something and then my wife has to do, you know, vice versa. If she's hurt her back, I have to pick up the slack. You know, that's how it works. A lot of things change, you know. I mean, a lot of my friends who used to be kind of liberal mm-hmm. had kids and now they're a little bit more conservative. You know, it's a pretty normal order of things. Yeah. You know, I like that phrase of yours, that I can't be without my faculties. You know, there's... With all the political cor- correctness foo for all going on on campuses right now, it does seem like a lot of universities have lost their faculties. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know what? I think. Uh, I how do you think about this this um, hypothesis I have. I think that from what I'm seeing and reading, there are an awful lot on these college campuses that are s- students that are starting to smell the coffee, so to speak. That are starting to understand. Look at students for life. All right. There is a movement happening right now in large numbers with these young people are saying we're not supporting abortion. You know, these these people are supposed to be the rebellious lot and the the progressive government role has become the standard bearer of the institutionalization of everything that they're supposed to oppose. Right. And um, so it would seem natural at some point for them to be rebellious by their very nature and go, wait a minute. Go, go to the opposite. That's thing. the thing that everybody wants. We should do something different. Now that I and and because we're in such strange times now, where the progressives have have such a you know a headlock on pro- political correctness, all this other stuff. Uh, my hypothesis is that there are many more students leaning toward the conservative side, and that is why you're having such uh, loud clamor from the left about what's happening. On our, you know, all Black Lives Matter, that kind of thing, uh, because they have to trumpet it. I think because they feel it slipping. I actually have five examples of why any normal human being, just these are just random, uh, in in the university system, who's a student, you know, or maybe a parent of a student, would think to themselves that there's something seriously wrong. Um, Washington State class requires white students to defer to students of color. The University of Tennessee, there was an initiative to ban yep. pronouns because pronouns are sexist. We have the idiocy of, idiocy of trigger warnings where academics are expected to predict who might be uncomfortable with an mm. upcoming statement. But now even the term trigger warning needs a trigger warning. <laughs> At the University of Missouri, a journalism professor called yeah. for muscle to remove a journalist from covering student protests yeah. over racial issues at the campus. And Don't Smith, they want the publicity? That was the bit that I couldn't understand. Smith College banned journalists from covering its campus protests unless they were vetted to be friendly to the cause. No objective journalists welcome. Right. So, you know, it's obviously... Well, why are they doing that? It's obviously an attack on free speech. Well, if they already have it. See, stop and think about it, right? I'm telling you, the media, who has been, of course, so implicit in, in this, right? Why are they turning the screws? Oh, absolutely. Why? This is what you're now seeing is the pinnacle of what most people call political correctness. It actually is cultural Marxism. Yeah. By the reshaping and redefinition of the language, they are suppressing political ideas that they don't wish to speak. Right. And I think the great thing about this is like what we oftentimes say, let the socialists talk. And people are seeing, you know, with Hillary and Bernie saying, this is what we're going to do. I think a lot of people are starting to finally wake up, the normal people, the yeah. people other than us who, you know, this is what we do. You know, we're immersed in this. Sorry. They're starting to see what is going on with these universities. And better yet, there's a lot of legislators, especially for the pro- the public schools, going, what the heck are you doing? Mm-hmm. And the universities have been able to kind of grow all by themselves and just suck up lots of money. And now the legislators are starting to say, we're not going to pay for all that. Right. Yep. And the people are starting to see this is the fight that going there, on. There, there is a fight there. And I think what you're seeing is the culmination of what the left has done as it's run through all of our institutions. They've taken over our uh, the elementary and the, the K through 12. Do they know history? No. Do they understand civics? No. no. Do they understand the philosophy of how this country was 
founded. No, what they do understand, at the very least, is just a bunch of old white rich guys with slaves created this country mm -hmm. without going into anything else. And that's all they know. They don't know about the Constitution. They don't know about the Bill of Rights. They don't know about natural law and the rights that pertain to us innately just because we are humans. Right. And you're seeing the debasement and the 180-degree turnaround of what definitions are mm -hmm. to where they believe because of this self-esteem, show up and get a trophy environment they've grown up <coughs> in from school – that they had to be protected from everything. Right. And I just can't wait. Either we're going to come in for a nightmare time mm -hmm. or it's going to be so much fun to watch these. Turn it around. Uh, these kids coming out of school and getting reality slapped in the face where, where normal people go, shut up. You know, uh, the whole <laughs> well, big thing. Uh, yeah, sorry. The thing I worry about is they get out there, they realize they can't get jobs, they go home, they live on welfare, and eventually welfare implodes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if we let this go on too long, we will have a critical mass of angry young military age people who can't get anything from society oh, on their terms. But they've been brought up such that they hate guns, so I feel safe. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't know that the dialogue. I, uh, but I, I, I just worry we get a Lord of the Flies situation where, the, where the, you know, there's enough of these kids and young adults that have got absolutely no sense and no morals are going to try and take over. See, I'm not at all. I don't. I'm not as um, pessimistic as that. I think that we're having this in the in the media, and it's the same thing at Planned Parenthood right now. The lay person that looks at Planned Parenthood sees these videos, and it makes them go, "Oh, okay, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the videos about child, you know, taking parts, body parts from babies." Right? It's just heinous, so that gets some attention. But the truth of the matter is, is that the the trending for the support of Planned Parenthood has been going down every single year. The abortion rate in this country has been going down every single year. So now, when we look at the push for Planned Parenthood to keep their hands in our pockets for that taxpayer funding, it's 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 not. We, we've got to skew this dialogue because the truth is they see they're taking a hit that never makes it in the media. They have to fight for the taxpayer funding because enough people are not coming into the doors the way they were for the abortions in the first place. So the onus for them is to absolutely make a death hold to keep the funding coming in because they need the taxpaying dollars. The door is not being used quite as much as it was in the past four or five years. So this tells me we're, we're making headway in the debate. The media will never let that out. No. If we fight someone, we fight the media. And I give Trump that at least. You know? we got about 20 seconds. All right. Uh, you guys can stick around. I don't know if Don's going to make it or not. Uh, he said he would. I, mean, I know he said he would, but I don't know if he's going to get here in time. So we're going to just hang on to you if you don't mind so, staying. We'll, we'll, and, keep uh, on, we'll just keep on rolling because we'll it's always fun to keep All right. on rolling. Everybody stay tuned. And this is Grok Talk. We are here in Concord in CNHT in the studio. Right. And we will be right back after this short break. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Steve McDonald here. Ever notice how some Democrats get all worked up about photo ID? No, not the ID you use to access all those government services like unemployment, Social Security, welfare, and even Obamacare. I'm talking about photo ID to vote. And I don't think it's the photo part. Democrats love photos. President Obama's got a real nice one of himself with that pretty Danish prime minister he took while his wife Michelle was sitting right next to him scowling. So if it's not the photo, it must be the ID. But the only reason to object to the ID would be if you were either not who you said you were or you didn't live where you said you lived. Which might explain why some Democrats get so upset when you ask for one. 
I say some Democrats, because almost 60% of registered Democrats and 75% of all registered voters thought voter ID was a good idea. So if it's not New Hampshire residents or even Democrats who oppose voter ID, must be the kind that can't get elected unless they can get people to vote in your town who have no business voting there. This is Steve McDonald for Granite Rock, and we'll keep shining the light on them for you. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, so I uh, I do most of my shopping online, and uh, you too. I do, but I do have to go out sometimes and shop out in the real world. Uh, because my wife wants me to go with her, and she doesn't like to go shop at night by herself, so Good. I'll go out to a store like a Target or a Walmart. Or, and um, uh, last night, do you, do you set off the metal detectors? No, I haven't set off any metal detectors yet. Yes, I do go armed. Um, <laughs> and so we were in uh, we were at the outlets in Merrimack. Uh, you know, these pricey high end stores, and uh, we were in these stores where they have eighty five dollar ties and one hundred and fifty dollar shirts and stuff. We were just looking for stuff because my wife had a gift card for the store. We're trying to find something for forty bucks or whatever. Uh, and we're walking around, but I'm noticing all these stores, whether it's Target or Walmart or anywhere I'm going. And you're talking Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights during the week. You know, it's two weeks before Christmas. There is nobody out. Yeah, you're right. Nobody. They, they're that? either all ordering online. And I, and you know, I talked to my UPS guy. He's 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 to the wall with work. You know, they all are because that's what happens. I mean, it's the it's the internet economy. It really is. But yep. usually, you see more people out in the stores, and I'm not seeing anybody in and the I stores. And I think that's a shame. It is. It it's is. a shame. You know what? what? Because we are abdicating our own humanity by being so attached to that box. I hate that box because you know what? You don't talk to anybody. You don't see anybody. You don't share good energy. You don't get to say Merry Christmas, eyeball to eyeball anymore. And we are losing a, a, a sliver of our socializing. I'm telling you, <laughs> you, you, you have no idea how much, how much oh. you can give to people when you go shopping and you're in a mass group and, and, and you're just present in the moment. I, I believe that. Excellent. Well, you know, I had this conversation probably 20 years ago. Let's see. No, longer than that. Back in the middle 80s, we were offered a, a deacon's retreat for my church, and I worked for digital equipment at that time. And I had friends all over the world mm-hmm. uh, through the digital network. And one of the things that I was always told that when you leave deck, you will feel a sense of loss because now you will be cut off from all those friends. And that's when I really started to realize that you can have virtual communities online and you will have friends that are as close to you there as what you can ever get. And I just look at Granite Rock Mm -hmm. and the writers and the community that we have there. But there were a couple of older guys, much older guys, you know, in their 60s on the deacon board, and they just couldn't get that concept of the online communities. And I'll take a little bit of issue with you, Jane, and and I understand what you're getting across, but I think that the online communities can be just as strong and just as powerful as those in the real world. I'm not talking powerful. Well, I'm uh, talking human. See, I look at it as... The connections that you can make online Mm -hmm. are no longer geography limited. Right. And those bonds can be just as strong online. I can't touch those folk. I can't look at him and say, hi, Don Hewing. How the heck are you? I I I need everybody to shift logical (laughs) right again. I can't. Hang on. Let's cozy up a little here. Yeah, cozy on up. Because, Don, we got to get you in the shot. But if I lean back, does that help? Help No, it doesn't. It doesn't help. It's okay. No, no, no. How does it not help? I mean, it gets me out of the shot. I don't know. Uh, Field of of view. (laughs) Rearrange the camera. Oh, no. Here we go. Don Hewing is here. Don is one of our many contributors. And uh, he's the uh, we like to call him the uh, the 
like the best letter writer in the state. He writes oh. LTEs to the yes. paper and stuff. Oh, right. And great stuff. We were That's talking right. about your LTEs earlier in the program before we started, actually. And, um, and uh, Don wrote a pretty long LTE to us asking for this <laughs> slot, actually. It yep, was, and uh, here he is. So, what? Don, why are you here? <laughs> I'm I'm here to participate. Okay, you're here to participate. But uh, you've, uh, had a, you've had a focus. You had an interest. You had well, an issue you, you wanted know, to discuss. Um, Skip talked about terrorism and and as a possible topic, and I have been a little bit thinking about about that. And it seems like we're always on the trying to deal with the back end of problems. We're dealing with the back end of drugs. We're dealing with the back end of we're fighting communism now because although we defeated it twenty five or thirty yeah. years ago. You know, we thought, well, all the communists went away. They didn't go away. They're here. And they became <laughs> environmentalists. You know, they went to our colleges, universities. They took schools, over the unions. Right? They, they, got, they got out from under the beds and took over the dorms. Yeah. Right. So uh, it seems to me the same thing with uh, with these terrorists, the Muslim terrorists. We'd, well, the good thing is that they say these terrorists aren't Muslim. Yeah, right. So we ought to be what? able we, I mean, which is, they're being politically correct, but we ought to take them up on it. If they're not Muslim, then we can do things which would be offensive to Muslims, but they're not Muslims. <laughs> well, you know, I really do have a problem because the White House is now going back to saying San Bernardino and this gun violence. Of course. You know, it just goes back to what Obama said in his book, the Dreams of My Father, that when the... W- Political winds go against Muslims. I will stand with them. And, and we've been has. seeing that through his entire presidency. Mm-hmm. But I think at this point, you know, here they are trying to do everything they can. And I put the, the cartoon up on Granite Rock from uh, Lucien.com, one of the sites I go to every day multiple times. Uh, they yeah. had a wonderful cartoon of there's the White House saying gun control. And then in the next pane, you see ordinary folks going into the gun shop. Mm-hmm. And I think people are starting to realize... Yeah, and Obama's saying from the White House, we need a gun ban. And the people are saying as they walk into the store, we need a gun. gun. Right. And, and the next frame is ISIS saying, yes, gun control. Gun control. Because yes. we like unarmed targets. Right. Yes. So, Just so like I, every so crazy I, so person. I, I have to ask what kind of, uh, of Shiite head uh, Obama actually is. Because he, he's, <laughs> he's, stand, he's standing with Iran more than anything else. He seems to be a Shiite sympathizer. Yes. Yet if you look at his origins, <clears throat> Kenya, Indonesia, you know, whether or not he was born any particular place, I don't care. The fact is, you know, some of his leanings come from this, the Kenyan influence and some come from the Indonesian. Isn't the Valerie stepfather. Jarrett Iranian? Yes, well, well, something. well, that's where I was going next because Shiites are a small minority in both Kenya and Indonesia. But, of course, they, they are the, uh, the dominant faction in Iran. Uh, and, yes, Valerie Jarrett is, uh, uh, is Iranian. What kind of marriage we, uh, have we really got here in the White House is what I want to know. Well, you, um, scary stuff. They're also uh, the Valerie Jarrett's. By the way, you have to move over that way just a Hang little on bit. a minute. It's a, it's, you know, um, Jen's going to start getting uncomfortable. This, this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we need a wider lens for our camera <laughs> right. or a bunch of little cameras. <laughs> um, but you, you look at the, the Chicago elite. That uh, f- from where she comes from, and they're all socialists, and they they make no bones about it. And you've got that uh, connection as well. Which you uh, know, but it's, it's again, you know, I mean, look at look at the look at the uh, East Coast states in particular, but the, most of the states that have got big capital cities in them, they've got the same problem. You know, whether it's New York State with the conservatives upstate trying to elect conservative folks to their state legislature and uh, and sh- Chicago with Illinois. Uh, when they say it won't play in Peoria, they're not saying it has to be communist to play there. It's freaking agricultural. These people are conservative, more so than we are probably. Uh, you know, but the, the heartland is conservative, but Chicago is communist. And, and so what you've got is you've got these failed city-states, and they are practically city-states, yep. within much larger sovereign nations of Massachusetts, New York, Illinois, etc., yep, uh, and, and, and Michigan. Let's not forget, uh, De- oh. you know, Dearbornistan, uh, the greater Detroit, <laughs> yeah, uh, the greater De- Detroit Sharia Empire. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know uh, these places are socialist, and they're in some cases going Islamic. Yeah, great well, point. But we got a court case coming up, the one one man one vote case, where instead of looking at the population, 
Texas, uh, some people in Texas have sued, and it's now made it to the Supreme Court, where it's going to be not the population, but the population of legal voters, which may very well decrease the importance of the large urban areas and and better get the you know folks like us out in the logical flyover more, country more to, the, more to the point wow. it will diminish the influence of the illegal aliens because right now that's right it is the illegal aliens or temporary residents that cannot vote but are counted as part of the population that's, that's the co- that's whole court sk- case that that, wow. ske- that skew that skew the number of congressional districts in favor of the states with the stupid sympathizers that let oh them in goodness. in the first place. I did not know that. Now, see, I learned something today. I did not understand that. I'd read that. some of that a couple of weeks yeah. ago. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm with you, Skip. Yeah. I, but we get away from Don. Don, sorry well, about gonna, it. We're just we get, ADD. No, we're no, going to no. get back to that. I, I posted okay. the uh, video yesterday of a woman who was raised Muslim who uh, had some things to say about Islam. And we're going to play that right here for hey, a second. Everyone. I have been putting off making a video for a long time and I have been trying to control my temper in my new effort to be a better person. However, seeing as to how people won't stop being dimwits, I'm going to have to spell this out for you. Islam is not a race. It's a religion. Therefore, when I say Muslims have to believe in Muhammad, their prophet, and follow him as their ultimate role model, it doesn't mean I'm a racist. Because Islam is not a race. If you believe in Muhammad and Allah, you're a Muslim. If you follow Muhammad as your ultimate role model, you're a Muslim. What did Muhammad do? He was a rapist, a pedophile, a mass murderer, not to mention a warmonger, liar, cheater, thief, adulterer. He- so you might want to listen to the rest of that. It's eight and a half minutes long. I'm not going to play the whole it's thing, but she right? basically yeah. goes. Let's, let's she Sounds goes like through the actual. Politician. He goes. She goes through the history of Muhammad because she's Muslim. She yeah. learns it. She knows the Quran. It's a great. Yeah. And and so she explains how he started out trying to be peaceful, and that didn't work. So he became a warmonger, and he just it just went where she just said, and that's who he is. And she talks about how if you say you are a good Muslim, then you must do these things that Muhammad said you should do. And, and that goes to, it goes right back to the origin. You you know whatever you think of Judaism and its heroes and Christianity and Jesus, basically good, fine, upstanding people stood up and said, "I know the the mind of God. You know, follow me." Paraphrasing, what uh, Muhammad did is he stood up and said, uh, "We're gonna we're gonna basically uh, plunder, loot, and rape guys, uh, and uh, my God's gonna tell me what we need to get that done." And she gets into the point where you know the idea is that the, there are you are either a Muslim, a good Muslim, or you are nobody. Right. And there is no middle ground. If you're going to say that you're a good Muslim and you're going to follow the teachings, and the teachings involve all those violent things, and they involve the terrorism, and you are allowed to lie, and you are allowed to cheat, and you can violate God's law, Muslim's law, if it advances the goal, the end game, which is converting everybody. And so that's what brings us to the terrorism. And, you know, the whole political class is hiding all of that. I got a oh. question for Don. And, uh, and we should let Don, Don loose for a while. <laughs> yeah. Don, we hear about Muslim, uh, the Muslim faith as just being a religion. But isn't it true that it really is a political system with Sharia law that is so intertwined it's almost tighter than the strands of DNA? Yeah, I think that that's, I think that's true. I wouldn't claim to be an expert in Islam, but... It's it's more than you you go and you pray five times a day and you do these other things. It also tells you how you live. It tells you how you can be governed. I mean, you're governed essentially under a theocracy. It's amazing that the the liberals in this country are trying to do away with oh all this religion any place in the public sphere. But you know, Islam is fine. If we can't say anything right. bad about Islam, right. even though. You know, it well, beheads people th- 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 and th- um, praying, yeah. believes in honor killings and all these other kinds of things. So, um, you said public square and praying five times a day. Is it not the case in certain places, such as some areas of New York, they pray five times a day in the middle of the goddamn street? Yes, they do. And, and, and is why should we not bulldoze that out of the public square? Thank well, you very much. You know, hey, 
I, I'm with you. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a really, really short break. We're going to uh, come back and let Don loose on the rest of what he has to say. Stay tuned. This is Grok Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GraniteRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. That's the song. Sound up like the Mr. Grinch song I know. This is Gary Hoey. Oh. Let's listen. So, uh, welcome yeah. back to Grok Talk. We are talking about terrorism, Islam. Tighten up your panty snowflakes. Here we go. Don, let us continue uh, well, our conversation. I guess Sorry the to first you. is how, how do we stop? How do we stop uh, terrorists from achieving their goal? I mean, if they believe that by killing themselves and others, they get to heaven and they get all those virgins and all that stuff, well, how, how, do we, how do we prevent them? Now, obviously, the other Muslim leaders say, oh, they're not Muslim. Okay, well, they're not Bill Muslim. Bill Clinton says you just get rid of all the virgins. They're not Muslim. Yeah, I mean, right. they <laughs> believe... You'll volunteer to do it. That's they right. may <laughs> believe... <laughs> they believe they're Muslim, and they're be- doing what they're doing because they believe it, but the others say they're not. So we'll agree, we'll agree with the others who are lying and, and say, okay, they're not Muslim. So, fine, we should be able to feed yeah. whatever's left of their bodies to dogs and pigs. <laughs> we should be able to bury them in pig fat in unmarked grave someplace that their families never get Boy, to know about. Boy, am I going to get hate mail. I don't, I, I don't know if I'd go that far, but you know what we could do is if that's true, you also wrote about special diets, right? Oh, yeah. You what, know, why, oh. Are we, why are we giving them special food we in our prisons? No, no, no. You special get food, caught. they get foot baths, no, 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 they no, no, get no, no. all kinds of stuff. That should be stopped because you know what? That's they're, not equality. They're not, yes, they're, and they're not, they're not Muslim. So why would we give them halal meals? That's right. I agree with that. Why shouldn't we feed them pork? And- well, well, here's here's the problem with what they're saying. I know that uh, certainly Obama has been very angry, calling them they're not they're not Islamic. Oh. They're just thugs with guns. The problem for for Obama is that. Every time he says ISIL, which is a slap in the face to uh, Israel, Israel, by the way, from the uh, from, of the Levant part of because that. the Levant it, includes Israel, right? Right. But the I, the first I, is Islamic, and you know who is Obama, this failed constitutional lecturer, supposed to say that I can declare who is Muslim or not? Baghdadi, who is the head of ISIS, has a PhD in Islamic studies. Hmm. So you know, from if, a Western university, I suppose. Uh, no, <laughs> no. So if if they're going to go after that, it's like, uh, I'm sorry, I can go after the the back row uh, Baptists mm-hmm. because that's the denomination I grew up with. But you know, is now Obama if he wants to go after who he says is not Muslim? Is he now saying that he's Muslim? But anyways, we interrupt Don. But, Don, but, we got to keep coming back. Well, no, to no. You. But I mean, I mean, that's my point. If they, if they want to declare they're not Muslim, then that's fine. Let's treat them as if they're not Muslims, and the politically correct folk cannot get upset if well, we treat. Well, it doesn't matter if they are or not, right? Well, I don't care, but well, you know, no, no. There's, there's actually, yeah, but there's two points to that. Which, which, you know, the one that Don's making is if we assume that if they are terrorists and we either apprehend or kill them, we can treat their bodies, live or dead, any way we like. Because they're not Muslims, because Obama said so. Yes. On, on, on and, and not just Obama, Muslim leaders, Muslims on the street. I've seen street interviews with Muslims. They say, "Oh no, if they're terrorists, they're not Muslim." 
Right. So, okay. So, so, Very good. So, so care uh, mm-hmm. can put their hissy fit away and straighten their panties because uh, if we we can treat these folks any way we like, because they'll have to disown them. Well, th- that's right. They have to disown them, or they have to admit the terrorists are Muslim. Yeah. A- a- exactly. But and, he- yeah, here's part of the problem, though, Don, and you probably saw the news that France has stormed, uh, you know, three different radical mosques in in France. Yeah. They gathered up. What do they call three hundred and thirty four uh weapons of war, and they've arrested and exported people. I mean, I thought Islam was the religion of peace. What are they doing with right. weapons of war in their oh, synagogue? across the they're, potomac they're across. defending themselves against those radical um um, Mormons. Long, <laughs> no, 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 you, you, you know, you know what? Uh, the, you, yeah, the, those pamphlets are sharp. You could get a paper yeah, cut yeah, from one of those things. They're defending themselves against, against long-haired radical socialist Jews because it's the time of year for those. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the old song? Yeah, yes. Right across the you Potomac know, River Mormons from Washington, D.C. They all over the a, world, and they, are. they attack. They are vicious, yes. Uh, yeah. Right across the Potomac from Washington, D.C., there is a huge mosque, and they have in that mosque... Terrorist propaganda, basically, yeah, uh, available. And here's what it comes and it's like. Oh no, no! All the schools that they're financing. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're full so of this why stuff. Is this and so who's addressed. financing all the schools, Don? Yeah, Saudi the, Arabia, the, our favorite friends. That's right. The Wahhabist uh, progenitors of all well, this. Stuff. In 2014, we let 54,000 students come come here to for our universities from Saudi Arabia. Come on, what's the matter with us? And and Bush started this. Yeah. Yes, he did. It doesn't you know, matter for, what party you're talking about anymore. No, no, it doesn't. No, no, that's no, right. It doesn't. They're, they're that's all tra- right. They're all trying to be nice guys and politically correct, and they're avoiding the obvious fact that this is not, by any normal understanding, a religion. It's a cult. It's not a religion. Uh, we're going to get hate mail for that too. I'm sure. Uh, it, it, it's a cult of Muhammad's personality and Muhammad's misdeeds, to be to be basically true. And the, bring the hate. The people that are out there that are good people that think they are Muslims, basically cannot be, by definition, both at the same time. Right. Well, uh, yeah. here, here's my take on it. Islam is not a religion. It, on the militant side, it is a political system using Sharia law wrapped up in a religious wrapper. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. And until some of our leadership, until all of the leadership can say that, right. mean it, and go after that, we yeah. are in Deep, deep. Well, you know, socialism and communism are political systems that behave like religions, and they require the same obedience. So really, it's the same thing. It it is a religion, but it's a religion designed to be a political system. But here's the big difference, though. Islam means submission. It's not peace. It Mm -hmm. means submission, submission to Allah and all of the precepts that go along with that. And while there is that continuity between the militant Muslims and the left, as you point out, Steve, trust me, they hate us because right from the get-go, they uh, the progressives are even worse than us constitutionalists. At least we can point to Can we call the, the progressives paper. moderate constitutionalists? No, <laughs> because the progressives <laughs> believe seriously in the rule of man, which is an anthem to Muslims who believe no law should be made other than what Allah has made. And that is the big chasm between, yes. you know, from, from the militant Muslims to, or the devout Muslims, the really devout, who, the fundamentalist Muslims, who believe that that is, you know, that's our way of life. That's why they hate us. They, even, they, they may be, de- you know, the ones that may be the, the devout may not take up arms themselves, but what they are teaching causes people to take up arms I, wow. I think it's, it's and a if they thing. and 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 I, we had this conversation last week. We talked about this. Like I told my wife, I said it, the actual um, less devout, less more the moderate Muslims, air quotes. Um, they t- know that they can't say anything because if they do, the good Muslims will, will not, take it out on them. Well, well, yeah, they're, they're no different. As soon as they speak up and say. Um, we denounce these people. They're intimidated into silence. They're they, threatened. Their yeah, lives are threatened. Their yeah, families yeah, are threatened. And they will yeah, be yeah, the, killed. And, and or, you know, there was a Muslim imam who spoke on, I believe it was a Hannity show, just two, yes, two yes. or three or four nights ago. And and he he supported peaceful. He supported actually Trump's saying, hey, you know, we should 
stop. We should pause this for a while until we understand how protect the American people. Mm-hmm. And he got fired. The he next day removed. he got fired yeah. from his from there you his go. Job. Right. And the ones that are really moderate, like Dr. Zudi Jasser, it gets yes. hate mail and threats. That's right. Death all threats the all the time. Don't yep. you think that as media, they've been able to like muck this up so much that the layperson is just lost? Yes. And, and the more clear that we become with the words, the one word that you said that I think we should just just throw at people all the time is theocracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because theocracy is anathema to the progressive. Yes, right. That's true. They right? accuse they us. God, they right? accuse yeah. us of wanting a theocracy. That's right. Any time, yeah. any time we try to incorporate moral values either into law or into or just by example. But they will support. Yes. They will support Muslims, Muslims. or not That's talk right. about Islam. Yeah. We should be batting them over the head every single let's, time talking about yeah. theocracy. Yeah. Let's remember. Let's remember <laughs> who else it was <laughs> that made. Strange bedfellows with with Islam. It was the National Nazis. Socialists. Thank you. Well, you, knew, you knew where I was going. I did. Yes. <laughs> well, expound. Be which, careful. Which, no, no. I knocked that over. That's so okay. it's and, 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 which is why Turkey should never be in NATO. No. Well, yeah. they are more related to the Germany that was van- vanquished than the Germany which is part of NATO. Do you see the picture of well, uh, Putin today. sitting yes, there going, today. looks like I'm having turkey for Christmas? <laughs> who, who, who did that? I don't know who did it. I just found I, it online. I, I'd like to get back to you got about your three point, minutes, so yeah. I'm not sure I agree totally about um, they hate us. You know, I think it's part of, are they civilized or are they not civilized? Civilized people seems to me, are raised to respect others. Other uncivilized people, and I think you take any group of, sorry, you know, uncivilized teenage and young adult males, you tell them that they have the right to go out and rape, rob, do whatever they want, and they'll go to heaven, and it's okay? They'll do it. Isn't that what, uh, what was the book that with Catcher on the Riot? Well, no. There has to be a hatred, though, for them. Hmm? There has to be a seed of hatred, Don, because rape, rape, is, rape is not a natural human thing. I mean, there is an anger and a violence and an ugliness it's inherent in that. It's about submission, James. It's about submission. Well, okay. I claim I'm not an expert on rape. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. But to me, it's a, do you believe you can do whatever you want? Get away with or do you believe you have to respect like, like, Actually, like, like go, the Pakistanis in Leeds and Bradford in England, for example? Right. Like, like no doubt the gangs in or, Dearborn. Or like there's been a lot of um, a lot of writing lately and research on on what has happened to modern black males who really have no sense of the future. They only live in the now and the today, and tomorrow doesn't really matter. So they yes. live, they die, whatever. And if you have that mentality, nothing you do has any consequence has, tomorrow yes. because there is no tomorrow. Yes. So if you go out with the idea that you can go to heaven no matter what you do. And you're locked yes. into that. Today is the only day I know yeah, about. That's yeah. true. Then nothing you do makes yeah. any difference. It does. You have no feeling about yeah. it. It's just sure. activity with right. no yeah. recourse, except what, what, heaven. That's the only thing yeah. they, they get. What do I heaven. feel good about today? Right. What makes yeah. me feel good at the moment? Right. So that's and all think, probably wrapped up in that. And these yeah. are people who don't have jobs. They have no future. Most of these young males, yeah. Muslim males, they live in, yeah. in societies where their future is either yeah. you know yeah. they're either well connected yeah. or they're not. Yeah. Which is kind of the society that the left wants for us here. The, the, well, that's the society that they've been creating for us right. here. Mm-hmm. That's correct. The destruction of the family, yeah. the single parenthood, which, which I don't know, is interesting. I was listening in Coulter's book the other is is the biggest predictor of whether or not you're going to go to jail, whether you're going to drop out of school, whether you're going to be, you know, un, unwed mother. Yeah. All these kinds of things that are bad for society and bad for individuals, right. bad for our country. Stem from that. Are all D- stuff D- promoted yeah. by the D- left? Don, you said one of those words in a very interesting way. You said single parenthood instead of p- single parenthood, which I, you know, since since the single <laughs> parenthood tends to happen in the hood, I thought you might have been implying something. No, no, there. and I don't mean that. I mean it's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with race. No, no, it has nothing to do with race. Well, it has nothing well, well, to do, well, has look, to do the, with sec- values. The, it has the, to do with that. Morality. That's a good point. The, I think the hood, that's right. the hood really has which is a theocracy. The, the no. hood really has nothing to do with ra- <laughs> race. It's just you know, basically. Low class neighborhoods that have become that way mostly due to liberal policies. All right, we're running out of time. We're back to Murphy Brown all over. Murphy again. Brown. All the way back to Murphy Brown. Everything's tied together. Can, can I close this out with a quote? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Notable quote by Kurt Schlichter Being a man and having a traditional family 
is a rebel act. By being a man, you reject the role the liberal elite has prepared for you, that of a weak, confused man-child unfit to be sovereign over your own destiny. Taking care of your family and yourself repudiates them. Defending your family, especially when you exercise your fundamental Second Amendment right, repudiates them. Raising your children as strong, independent Americans instead of spoiled, cry-bullying snowflakes repudiates them. Just being normal repudiates them. That was too long. (laughs) All right, we're going to go take a break. Uh, you guys can all stick around. If our guest doesn't call in, we need something to talk about, right? I mean, oh, they're calling in now. All right, Skip, you take care of that. And we will be right back after I turn down his microphone and everybody else's microphone. Just stick around. You don't have to go anywhere. We'll be here for a couple minutes. Uh, this is Grok Talk. Stay tuned. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House. this is Grok Talk. Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, TheRockNHCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Our own Mike Rogers reported this week that Senator Ted Cruz got the big get for Republican primary candidates in Iowa. I'm referring to the endorsement of the CEO of the family leader, Bob Vanderplatz. It's a great day here in the state of Iowa, and we're thrilled to be putting our support behind Senator Ted Cruz. I, I, well, I really believe he has the opportunity to unite conservatives, not only in Iowa, but across this country. Uh, he's a man of great principle. He has a titanium spine. I think people see him as a serious leader, someone who's willing to take on both sides of the aisle, but really to cast a, a vision of bold leadership for this country. And I think that's why you're seeing the uptick in the polls already in Iowa. And we're just hoping to add fuel to that to that fire. And so Ted Cruz is not the guy who's going to go to D.C. to go along, to get along, say, with John McCain and, and Schumer and others. But he's going to go to Washington, D.C. to make a difference, and that's to represent the people of this country. It is a nod that has significant sway in the state, which, unlike New Hampshire, has more evangelicals than you can shake a stick at. Cruz was already ahead of Trump in Iowa in at least one poll. With less than two months to the caucus, those numbers will likely improve. The Vanderplatz endorsement has elevated likely nominees to victory in that state in the past two cycles, and since 1976, the winner of either Iowa or New Hampshire, with one exception, has won their party's nomination. Meanwhile, in New Hampshire, the first official primary state, a recent poll shows Donald Trump in the lead with Governor Christie in second place. The WBUR poll tapped 402 likely voters about their preferences. No other poll yet shows Christie with this much popularity in the Granite State, but the Rhino endorsement rollout we've been chronicling in New Hampshire as moderate luminaries like Jeb Bradley and Sherm Packard back the governor is having some impact, clearly drawing support away from the Lost Boys milling at the bottom of the pack and uniting the party before principal crowd behind a standard bearer. Coming up today on the program, we've got some folks from New Jersey who will share some unpleasant truths about gun rights in that state and how after years under Governor Christie's leadership, citizens are still being denied their constitutional rights. You want to know why the American people are frustrated. You want to know why they're ticked off. You want to know why they cannot understand. It's not that we keep losing elections. That would be frustrating. But you could understand. We've got to do a better job. We've got to motivate people. We've got to convince people. We've got to get a message that resonates. We keep winning. And the people we elect don't do what they said they would do. Steve McDonald here. Ever notice how some Democrats get all worked up about photo ID? No, not the ID you use to access all those government services like unemployment, social security, welfare, and even Obamacare. I'm talking about photo ID to vote. 
And I don't think it's the photo part. Democrats love photos. President Obama's got a real nice one of himself with that pretty Danish prime minister he took while his wife Michelle was sitting right next to him scowling. So if it's not the photo, it must be the ID. But the only reason to object to the ID would be if you were either not who you said you were, or you didn't live where you said you lived. Which might explain why some Democrats get so upset when you ask for one. I say some Democrats, because almost 60% of registered Democrats and 75% of all registered voters thought voter ID was a good idea. So if it's not New Hampshire residents or even Democrats who oppose voter ID, must be the kind that can't get elected unless they can get people to vote in your town who have no business voting there. This is Steve McDonald for Granite Rock, and we'll keep shining the light on them for you. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Welcome back to Grok Talk. Thanks to Jennifer Robodeau and, of course, Jane Cormier for coming in to talk to us about some life issues. Uh, our our co-writer, Dan, Don Ewing, is still here talking about the Muslim terrorism issue we had last segment. Make sure you check that out if you missed it. And, uh, as always, thanks to CNHT, Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, for allowing us to use this spacious room in the middle of their offices to do our program every week. We feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Don, of course, uh, is is big on gun control. He can shoot really straight. Yeah. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? All right. Well, let's talk about gun control because we have some guests on the phone. We have uh, Dan Francisco and Alex Rubian, and uh, they're coming to talk to us uh, as representatives of the New Jersey Second Amendment Society about uh, some recent videos they've released, uh, undercover videos on the problems with getting a concealed carry license in the state of New Jersey. Good morning, gentlemen. Which somehow hasn't got any better Good under morning. a Republican I governor. I thought the governor was pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment. <laughs> well, why don't we let them explain that to us. Okay. Gentlemen. Good morning, guys. Hey, how you doing? It's doing great. Uh, this is Alexander. And, uh, most of the country vaguely understands how anti-Second Amendment New Jersey really is. However, they don't really understand the process that we have to go through. 48 other states basically allow you to go in and apply if you have an application process at all. Um, but you were talking about concealed carry applications. The permits that we were being blatantly discriminated against were actually just for a firearm identification card, which just allows you to buy a long gun. And we launched this investigation in response to the murder of Carol Bowne, who was the five-foot woman that was murdered by her psychotic ex-boyfriend while she was literally waiting for permission from the government of New Jersey uh, on how to defend herself. Okay. Oh, hang on a second. I'm having some problems with some echo here, so I'm working it out. Um, all right, you had two videos released. You're releasing another one real soon, is that correct? Yeah, we're releasing another one this weekend. Okay, great. Hang on, Mike. Hang on, Mike. Okay, excellent, and we'll look forward to seeing the link to that so we can post it in conjunction with this, with this interview. Absolutely. You can find it on our YouTube channel at NJQAS. If you just search that on YouTube. Also, our website is NJ2AS.com, and we're posting them on the homepage. All right, so you're, I've watched some of the videos, and it looks to me, basically, like there's just... Uh, let me rephrase this. I've been thinking about it since since we started to book this interview, and I'm ta- I'm thinking, you know, you have you have a governor, and he's the chief executive, and he has an attorney general, and they're pretty much responsible for ensuring or guaranteeing the equal application of the law. And having watched the video, it occurs to me that that's just not happening. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, this is Daniel, by the way. Um, the, the important thing to, to illustrate with with this state and this process is it's twofold. What Alexander just described is, you know, what we were trying to do 
but, but, but the important thing to note here is that when you go from police department to police department here in New Jersey, and all applications of any kind start at the municipal police department, not only do these individual departments themselves not understand the law and misapply it and often break the law, requiring things that are not part of uh, what's spelled out by our legislators as requirements, but on top of that, they are all horribly inconsistent. We can go to one police department and, and they'll tell us that you need X, Y, and Z and go to a second police department with the same person. They'll say, I'm just not going to give you a gun. Um, the first video is, is, is a great example of that in that uh, a gentleman who is disabled, uh, had a spinal cord inju in, uh, injury from an accident, goes in to speak to a detective in Orange, New Jersey. And the detective, uh, thinking that we were just going to have a discussion about the delays in getting a permit, openly starts boasting how he's denied elderly women how he's denied men who have gone to see a psychiatrist. Now, granted, he's not, he, he did not, was not in a mental institution or anything like that, uh, was not adjudicated mentally ill. He just confessed that he had seen a psychiatrist and then was denied. Um, he's openly denying small women and blatantly says it's not their fault they're females, but I, I can't have them have guns. So what we're getting at is this gentleman who, uh, with this disability, was told by this detective that he would be denied. Meanwhile, he's an undercover reporter who holds a firearms ID card in another town and shoots competitively. So it's not only that the laws are, are, are very restrictive, but that the police departments and the courts are then given this free reign to do whatever they please inconsistently. And that's really the, the, the terror that we deal with here in New Jersey. No, no um, I was reading some notes you guys had. There's uh, 9 million citizens in the state and only, what, 2,000 issued carry permits? Is that correct? That, that's correct. And the only people that are, are given those permits are, and that includes retired law enforcement who do have the ability to get those permits. So out of 9 million people uh, of under 2,000, there's that's uh, retired law enforcement and then friends of politicians. If you happen to be connected to a state senator, a mayor, uh, we actually have more content that we've yet to release where we discuss how prosecutors and judges in court joke about how they are the only ones that have permits as other citizens are in court trying to get a permit. So that, that's going to be part of the, of the message as well, that these permits are non-existent in New Jersey. But the problem is we bill ourselves as a May issue state. The NRA bills us as an May issue state. However, you'll see that it is impossible to get a permit. No civilian will ever get one. That's... that's um... I don't even know how to phrase that because, you know, I'm in New Hampshire and uh, we have a, a few circumstances that we're, we're beginning to address where people are coming out and saying, you know, because they were very openly uh, in support of legislation to get rid of our carry license, which we do have, uh, the pistol revolver license. But generally it's, you know, it's, it's cheap by cheap by cheap. It's pretty easy. I mean, you walk in, you give them 10 bucks or whatever, and you get your license. It's, it's not a big deal. We all carry uh, at least two or at least half of us have guns right now on our persons. You know, it's not really a big deal here. But uh, some chiefs have started to demonstrate that, that, that discrimination that where they say, you know, it, we're not going to give you a permit because we feel like it. So um, our answer has always been obviously legislative solutions. I don't know if that's an option for you guys. This, is this your only recourse to just make it so public that everybody else stands up and says, hey, stop that? Yes, uh, it is. You know, the main issue here also is why hasn't Governor Christie acted on this? We've been, uh, we've been telling you for over five years now about the problems and all the issues we're dealing with on the town level. And for him to say there's nothing he can do, you know, is, is misrepresents the whole issue and is not being, you know, genuine. You know, to say that he cannot write a letter to the Attorney General, which there then they notify the police department to follow the law, and this is the law. You know, if I were to accidentally go out and leave the house because I misunderstood the law and carried my gun, you know, I would be arrested and be serving 10 years in prison. But when the police and the government of New Jersey do it, you know, they're given a, uh, you know, they're, they're given impunity. So why is it that we get treated like second-class citizens, but they can just stomp all over our rights. Forget about the constitutional issue. This is blatant discrimination. I mean, this is what we documented over and over and over again in all different towns. So the big message is to build a groundswell here of attention to really force Governor Christie to act on this, because if, he can, if he's telling people that he doesn't have the ability just to write a letter to the police chief and say, knock the crap out, issue people their permits, you know, uh, you know, then we don't know what he's going to potentially do if he ever became president. You know, that, that's a good question. This is Skip, no. by the way. Hang on.
Sorry, go ahead. Oh, now he turns up my I have my to have volume. all the mics down because of the <laughs> phone conversation thing. Sorry about that. Um, certainly, Chris Christie, as he's been up here in New Hampshire quite a bit, and it seems like the establishment GOP is coming out for him like uh, barbarian, the barbarian horde all of a sudden. <laughs> um, he has made efforts to say, well, look, I am pro-gun. I, I got rid of that uh, restriction on 50 cal machine uh, – not machine guns, but 50 cal uh, – Rifles, and he he's tried to make it sound like he's a second amender uh, up here. So, what would you say to the the cons- especially the conservatives who we really do reach here at Granite Rock and uh, Grok Talk? What would you tell them about what you think Chris Christie is all about, and why do you think he's trying to play uh, the game of well, he's doing one thing, his actions in one, as one thing in New Jersey, but he's saying other things to us here in New Hampshire and across the nation. Well, let's, uh, let's put it this way. The, the genesis of, of Chris Christie's political career was in 1993 when he ran for uh, a state assembly position against the candidate, uh, Michael Patrick Carroll, who is still serving in our state Senate, who is a known libertarian maverick in our state, one of the few lone libertarian voices in, in, in New Jersey, uh, in a sea of, of statism. He ran on the very principle that he was against the assault weapons ban back in 1993. Uh, Excuse me, he was for the assault weapons ban back in 1993. Michael Patrick Carroll was for it, and this is the attack ad that he put out. It's a famous uh, piece of literature that is uh, sort of a legend here in New Jersey in the Second Amendment community, and recently came up actually on an interview, I believe, with Brett Baer on Fox News. Um, That is something that he hasn't been able to escape. Now, in his tenure as governor... He's had multiple opportunities to make changes, uh, and unfortunately, people paint the picture when they start talking about, oh, he's pro-Second Amendment. We've had a swath of gun control bills go through our state uh, Senate and our Assembly, and essentially he, he vetoes half of them and signs the other half, and then proclaims you know, and runs on the fact that he's vetoed five of those bills and that he's a champion of the Second Amendment. At the end of the day, the real issue, um, beyond the permitting and, and the, the, the delays and all that, which are partially municipal, partially legislative. At the end of the day, the worst issue in New Jersey that keeps our citizens disarmed is a clause called justifiable need. It's a catch-all uh, legislative clause that permits judges at, in the Superior Court to deny people for any reason by saying that they don't have enough of a justifiable need to have a carry permit. And using self-defense as a, as a reason for your application is not sufficient, which is sort of what Alexander was alluding to before. Chris Christie has the ability to go to his attorney general and say, look, we are going to issue uh, an interpretation of justifiable need via executive order and say that self-defense is an acceptable reason uh, uh, to get these applications. Uh, Just like he did with Shanine Allen, uh, the woman from Philadelphia who was arrested, uh, I believe, a year or two ago, Alexander? Was that last summer? Oh, sorry, I think Alexander's on mute here. But she, she was arrested uh, for be- bringing a, a weapon into New Jersey, carrying and uh, admitting to a police officer that she was carrying during a traffic stop and then was subsequently arrested due to our carry laws. And Chris Christie was able go, to go to the attorney general, put her through pretrial intervention, and, and get her out of that mess. So we don't understand why he can't do the same for this justifiable need clause. It's that he doesn't want to. But to answer your question, he's running for president of the United States. And if he wants to fare well in more uh, freedom-embracing and uh, liberty-loving states like New Hampshire and caucus states like Iowa, that are more socially conservative, he knows he has to come to the right on these issues. So it's it's all a ruse. And here in New Jersey, we're still suffering, and people like Carol Bowne, unfortunately, are still dying because of these laws. All right, gentlemen, uh, hang on. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned. This is Grok Talk. We'll be right back. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Our Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, coming to you almost live, most of the time, nearly every Saturday. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. 
as I lower the wrong volume. There we go. Thanks again to CNHT for using, letting us use the space and allowing us to pay them for phone and internet. <laughs> All right, we are on the phone with uh, uh, Dan Francisco and Alex Rubian, uh, New Jersey Second Amendment Society, and we are talking about Chris Christie, and we're talking about guns in New Jersey, and... All kinds of good stuff. And Mike, at the end of the table, uh, had some questions. So let me just uh, defer to him. Sure. Hang on. I think Alex is talking. Can you uh, crack yep. him up? Yep. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I know. I, I noticed that. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, hi. So uh, first of all, uh, you know, most states have constitutions which guarantee the right to bear arms. Does New Jersey have... Does, does New Jersey have an underlying right to bear arms in, embedded in its constitution, or is it all, or is it all by sort of government permission? And uh, and, and uh, you know, if so, if it does have such a right, how has it been chipped away? Hey, uh, we do we do not have in our constitution the right to bear arms, and unlike other states in New Hampshire, which do, uh, our rights are chipped away. And if they're not going to be denied through legislation, the police departments or other government entities arbitrarily make their own rules. If you're going to, you'll notice in our third video that we're going to be watching this weekend. Now the superior courts actually make up their own rules, where when you apply for a concealed carry permit, you have to put your resume, your job, you know, your 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 job experience and your um, your education down in the application. That's not law. If you look at the New Jersey statute, that's actually illegal to do that, requiring any additional information and any, any additional forms. When I confronted the clerk about this, she's saying, well, that's what the judge wants. If you have any problems, take it up with him. And uh, taking up with him means you have no recourse. They make all these laws that say, sure, this is illegal to do, but there's no teeth in it. And in a case where a city like Jersey City was actually sued, they lost the lawsuit because they were requiring additional information. And this is almost two years ago. To this day, they're still violating the law. The police chief blatantly saying, I don't care. You can do nothing about it. You can, and they break the law. They get away with it because there's no recourse. Do you have another question? No, no, no. Only, okay. only, the, only the traditional revolutionary bum thought that enough, if enough citizens crossed over into, Philadelphia, into Pennsylvania and armed themselves, uh, the police would have a very hard time arresting them all. I'm not suggesting revolution. <laughs> Oh, you're not this time? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that brings the problem. Yeah, the problem in New Jersey is we've been over fifty years of this anti-gun indoctrination, where people have just been beaten down. They've just denied people's rights. It's it's clearly like Stockholm syndrome, you know. And we've talked <laughs> to so many people about this by saying, "Stand up for your rights." We record the government violating your rights, and people are just like, "Well, maybe it's good that we do this." Even the news reporters from the local newspapers are saying. Well, is it all right that the police officer denies a woman her ability to buy a gun? How do we know that she was suitable? How do we know she wasn't going to buy some large firearm? I mean, imagine the DMV, which is the Department of Motor Vehicles, denying a woman a license because she wanted to buy a Ferrari, and that man saying, I don't think you can handle that powerful car. I mean, there would be massive outcry. Or an, or an SUV, because it's a little woman, big car. Yeah, or denying, you know, uh, a CDL license, you know, commercial driver license to small women, because... You know, some chauvinistic man doesn't think that she can handle that that vehicle. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we deal with. That when I talk to people from out of state, it just you know it blows their mind. And you know, being a Second Amendment advocate, like I truly understand the meaning of that. And people like you definitely do as well. So it bothers us when we have candidates like Governor Christie running for president, claiming that he's such a star supporter of the Second Amendment. Next time he says it at a town hall. Ask him how many types of guns he's shot or what types of guns he owns. And also ask him what he's possibly done to help people get issued concealed carry permits in the state of New Jersey. Because at a swipe of a pen, he could blatantly change the law through an administrative code change, but he chooses not to. This is Skip again. Project forward because you know what we're seeing here in New Hampshire is he's rapidly rising in the polls now. Whether this is just the the usual up and then back down again movement, I'm not sure. But if he were to gain the presidency, what would you think would happen as far as the national Second Amendment rights? What do you think he would do? Would he just kind of go along to get along? So, or would we always have to guess how is he going to? Uh, 
not vote, but rule in this particular on this particular piece of legislation? Will he sign it to enhance our liberty, or will he go as ah, security and safety? He's going to you know probably enforce uh, the law, which even if the law sometimes is very vague or arbitrary or doesn't support the Second Amendment, you know, this is what Obama does. And you know the big issue, the big thing we have to be asking is. Why are we as conservatives always on the defense? Why are we the ones always having to, you know, take up the stuff and have to respond to people like Governor Christie or President Obama's executive orders in the courts? And that's a big problem here. And I, I can I can piggyback on this. You have to remember his background here. Chris Christie is born and bred in New Jersey. He's a prosecutor from New Jersey. He's made his career prosecuting and defending the existing laws and the climate, political climate in this state. This is what he knows. This is what he's used to. Again, remember, he ran and began his political campaign on the idea that we needed the assault weapons ban here in New Jersey. So this is in the back of his mind. He's also an opportunist. So on that national stage, he'll say that he's for things and he stands with the Second Amendment. But at the end of the day, I could never see him um, going out of his way to do anything. An excuse that he always says here in New Jersey is, bring me a Republican legislature and I'll, I'll give you concealed carry, which we all know is nonsense. He can flick the switch by changing the interpretation of justifiable need, or at the very least, witness that in these, in these towns, there's massive inconsistency in the way that they apply the laws, not even in carry permits, but in purchase and possession permits, which most people are outrightly denied by the police department's conduct. Imagine if Obama responded to all this outcry for gun control by saying, give me a Democrat Congress, and then I'll pass all the gun control that you want. He doesn't do that. You know, we know that he doesn't do that. We know he's going to be ramming down executive order, as he has in the past. And the difference here is that when you compare Governor Christie to people like Donald Trump, I'm not making any endorsements here, but people like Ted Cruz or Donald Trump that actively and openly support concealed carry, you know, you cannot compare the two. And people that claim to understand the Second Amendment are the ones, the first ones to never understand it. And that's one of the things that, even as a New Jersey, and I became a firearm five years ago, and I used to listen to these discussions, but as I became a firearm owner, as I started purchasing different types of firearms, as I started getting self-defense training, I started to realize, why should I be asking for any permission from the government? We had a meeting at Governor Christie's office in January of, of this year saying that the laws that are on the books now, the way the towns are applying the laws, people are dying because they're waiting for permission and they're waiting for their permits. All he had to do was write a letter either enforcing it or doing executive action saying, make sure all the, everything gets done within law and within a you know, respectable time frame. And if he did that, if he did stand up to the Second Amendment like other legislators have in this country, you know, Carol Bound and other women could be alive today. All right, we're uh, almost out of time. Um, NJ2AS is a nonprofit, is that correct? It's N- yes, it's a nonprofit. It's NJ2AS.com if you want to visit the website. And you'll also find us on YouTube and Facebook. Right, and I, I notice it's much easier to find your videos on the NJ2AS channel on YouTube. Uh, so we'll get them from there and, uh, and put them up. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, just a tip, your, your front page of your website, there's only one of them that's easy to find. Um, but uh, the, the YouTube channel is really good, so uh, we'll link to we're that. Gonna, we're going to help them with that, so we'll be doing that. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, right. everyone. Okay, have a great weekend. All righty. Important news right there, ladies and gentlemen. New Jersey has some carry laws that are perfectly acceptable. They're just not being enforced, and Governor Christie could fix it. But he hasn't. So uh, I think we'll be advertising that <clears throat> just a little bit. <laughs> uh, got about a minute um, before we go to break. So, uh, so why are we on the on the uh, on the back end side of this one again? Uh, you know, it seems to me with all these gun free zones shootings, where innocent people have no ability to defend themselves, we ought to be using those and using these cases of women with restraining orders who were denied gun permits who get beat up and killed. Well, I think we are. And, and the problem is that we need to keep doing it and we need to get it 
into the media because the right. regular media doesn't cover it. Yes. And the people we need to reach are, are those people. They're the ones that, you know, I used to be those people, so I know. And we also, we also need to reach, you know, state legislators. And let us not forget the sovereign states. There should be no such thing as a federal gun control or gu- federal gun-free zone except such areas of Washington, D.C. as they designate because that's their playground. I'm going to cut you off because we have the whole next segment to talk about this. Oh. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. This is Grok Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GreenwichRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk. Brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right. Wanted to point out that Newark, New Jersey is the ninth most dangerous city in America, which means that they do, as Don asked on the break, have some illegal gun violence occurring no. Uh, no. Uh, in their within and their so w- within their political borders. They protect and, everybody. And, and Newark isn't the worst part of New Jersey no, either. Isn't, isn't Camden the uh, the absolute pit? Uh, Camden's pretty bad. I don't know where it falls on the on the. It was large cities, two hundred thousand or more. Maybe Camden's not big enough. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would think it would be. It's pretty big. Yeah, oh, yeah. but it's all the fault of all of those liberal gun law states like ours because they slept them in from there. It's That's always right. somebody else. Oh. With progressives, it's always somebody else's fault. Right. Because it's the sim- fault. Because simply having self-discipline and behaving yourselves and thinking that an armed society is a polite society is too much for their little minds to comprehend. So where, where I was going before the break was, look, we have sovereign states. The federal government has its certain playgrounds, which are basically military installations, <coughs> post offices, and Washington, D.C., which they've made a pretty good hellhole of already. Oh, and, those and, are all well protected. Nothing happens, sir. Are, are you kidding? Anywhere <laughs> outside of the government <laughs> buildings, you're subject to uh, gang violence, uh, robberies, and what have you. But, oh, but be, but places be, like Fort Hood, they're peaceful, yeah, no yeah. problems. But be that, be that as it may. The, the federal government has its playgrounds. It has no right, no matter what legislation it passes, to impose federal gun-free zones on other locations in the sovereign states. And it is time for the sovereign states to stand up and say so. The problem yeah. with that whole argument, while it is absolutely correct constitutionally and in theory and within the legal framework, the de facto part is that we have been turned by progressives into believing that other people are responsible for our safety, that we should necessarily follow a more Hobbesian view that the state is responsible for us rather than us for ourselves. We have seen the deterioration of that self-respecting, self-reliant, rugged individualism become... Uh, not something to be emulated, but as a target for derision. And to Don's point, uh, and let me get to there, uh, those people that are supposed to protect us are under no obligation to do so and can't be held to account. So That's right. with the getting in front of it idea, yes. that is something that people don't know. They right, don't right. know enough about the fact that the police 
according to the Supreme Court, Court. have yes. no obligation to defend you, yes. and you cannot hold them responsible and, and, when and they fail to do and so. And there's a particularly horrendous case of a multiple rape uh, by armed folks in, or well, actually, I don't even know if they are armed, just by thugs in D.C., the one place where, where, or almost the one place where it's the hardest to get guns in America. Uh, and 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 that's the one where the Supreme Court actually ruled the police had no obligation to actually find out if your call for help was genuine if if they got no response at the front door. <laughs> Correct. So people don't understand that. Uh, well, that, that's not true because every time there's a terrorist attack, millions of Americans go out and buy a gun or buy another yes. gun. And so there are people in the world who are like not paying any attention yes. to the noise and are going, you know what? It's obvious. That's right. That nobody's going to protect me but yes. me. And it's also obvious that nobody's going to protect the children but yourselves or the teachers. The teachers should be armed. Done. That's right. I, I think what we, where we are is we, we've had 50 years of anti-gun propaganda. Good people don't have guns. Guns are bad. And look, when I grew up, you know, we watched Gunsmoke. We, you know, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Festus. I love Gunsmoke. Everybody had a gun. I mean, everybody, children were taught how to handle guns. We didn't have mass shootings. We didn't have stuff, up, you know, enormous amounts of crime and stuff. So uh, we have gotten all this propaganda for 50 years that these are bad and gun, people who like guns are bad and people who have guns are terrible and they cause all this stuff. And, and like so much else, I think law abiding people or conservatives, anyway, let this propaganda go on we didn't fight it just like we didn't fight the welfare stuff we didn't fight all this other stuff which was destroying our society um and we we let it go because oh those are the experts or whatever and maybe they know well they don't know and we have to start trying to fight back with that idea and i do think what you're talking about with your reaction to these mass shootings where people are standing up saying i i realize now well I, i someone has to stand up somebody has to be there Somebody has to be in that room where the shooters come in to shoot 14 people, and one or two people starting to shoot back might have really cut the carnage. Absolutely, for for a couple of reasons. It's when you said the one or two, or maybe three. Uh, yeah, or when, five. Well, yeah, when the terrorist walks into the room, if one person pulls out a gun, he's going to turn that way, and it's going to yes. be a, a tough call whether that one person does enough damage <clears throat> before they're killed. If two or three people pull out guns, That's right. he's going to hesitate because he's not going to know which way for tur- to turn yeah. long enough for them to get him. Plus, and, plus, the people who are there who aren't armed have an opportunity to tackle him Yes. While he's distracted by the gun owner. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's a win-win-win situation. Yeah. Uh, abs- absolutely. And uh, a, actually, all you have to do is is, is stop him or has it? You know, somebody starts shooting at you. I suspect you're going to duck. Even I would if think you know if, if I'm in a room and I've been disarmed for some reason, and somebody comes and starts shooting, I'm throwing my chair at them. Yes. I'm turning my table. Over. I'm doing something. I'm not just going shoot me, shoot me. I mean, I don't know what happened. I, but. You know, your first action has to be stop the shooter, if whether you're armed or not. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened yeah. down at that community college, and I can't pronounce the that's, name, yeah. where the the vet, the, the vet army vet, attacked did them. exactly that. Now, he got shot seven times, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, the other people in the room, Didn't. again, being conditioned not to do anything, just froze and did nothing. Now, mm-hmm. yes. we weren't there. Would we do the same? Who knows? I don't th- I Well, I'm... I'm quite sure I would try to do something. I'd be like, Re- remember when Ben? <laughs> yeah, where is it? Where's Get my it gun? <laughs> remember what? when Ben Carson, in reaction to that, was asked about that? He said, "If you get it, you have to do something." And remember, you have to attack. Oh, you're and he was so criticized. Oh, you're criticizing those poor victims. Da, 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 da. But he was absolutely right. Yeah. You have to react. You and the question to, to get in front of it is, why were they victims? And it's the college culture. It's yep, the media culture. That's exactly It's the progressive right. culture that you're talking about. That's right. They taught them to roll over and, and die. die. That's exactly right. And, and, and so you know, we, we get back to the, the sovereign states should declare that there is no such thing as a federal gun-free zone except on federally owned property, but, at which point it's their choice to be victims. But they're not going to do it. You know why? Because they're on the hook for – because they're – They've already got their, um, what should we say, they're, they're bribed and controlled because the places that have been made into federal gun-free zones are the ones the feds are helping to pay for. 
That well, they have right. Right. Like, right. like schools. And, you know, we need a couple of states with the brass ones to actually stand up and say, you, the, uh, because you're paying us so much less than you promised to pay us, because your programs are so damn much more expensive than the money you're providing, we're going to recast the programs according to our image and likeness. We're going to say no thanks to your money, and we're going to ignore all your rules and regulations. It's important because I, – I... You know, I, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but when I go on sometimes to post stuff, I'll see some things from people. And somebody posted something about how we need better presidential candidates, and then and I, I took the opportunity to write, well, you know, uh, if you spent more time locally on your governors, your county sheriffs, yep. I said, that is where you need to start. You yourself probably cannot stop whatever is going to happen in D.C., but you yep. can stop what happens in your own town and your own county, and you need a county sheriff who's going to defend the Constitution, and you need a governor who's going to back up that sheriff. And if you don't have those things, none of this other shit matters. Yeah. Just like uh, Grokster Susan, whose mantra in life is, you know, screw, screw DC, save, save New, New Hampshire. Hampshire. <laughs> Let's say that loud and clear. Absolutely. Way to go, Susan. And it's difficult. A- and you Emily, can't just, and, and I mean, Emily Sandblade, who's working with her. Right. You need to organize people. You need to write letters to the editor to get in front of the people who don't follow programs like this take the example of of don here who writes more letters to the editor than any other single living uh, being yeah in but New Hampshire. you guys write stuff yeah but they, they didn't give you your own, they didn't give you your own column yet <laughs> they didn't give you your own column yet <laughs> no. you know if, if they give Craycraft that weekly column they ought to be giving you one as well i, I, I wouldn't Team want you up one. with me i wouldn't want one. oh i would love to see you have one i wouldn't want one why if i had to do it under under a pressure, under duress <laughs> Yeah, a whole week. You turn out three, four, five. Actually, no. It is different though because I've been I've yeah, been I, writing for for Franklin for a while, and once you have an editor and they have their own, you know, columns of thought and process and, and agenda and so on and so forth, and you write your thing and you send it to them, and then they they do something to it, you know, and they send it back to you or whatever, and it's just a different process. I can write on Granite Rock all day. And, and just throw stuff out and write it the way I want. But they have certain things they require, and it changes the way you look at the, what you write. It really does. I, I would I would be like, i got to write a story this week. I need, I need some extra cash, you know, because they were paying me. And um, so I'd have to think about the pitch. I'd have to think about – I'd have to have it blocked out in my head already. I don't write that way normally. Normally I, I know what I want to say, and then I say it, and then I arrange it, and then I post it. And it's completely different when you're writing for a publication. It really is different mentally. It's just weird. Yeah. Well, I used to write letters to the editor years ago before I started Granite Rock. And I did have a semi-regular column in one of the local papers. And you're right. It is different. You have to really – I mean, y- your first pass is like four times larger than the, what they'll allow. And you have to say, what do I pull out and still keep what it is I'm trying to get across? And you do that very well. You really do. Oh, thank you. And uh, I mean, you, yeah. And I just love the way that you go, just like we do uh, on the larger scale. But you get to point out who it is you're writing against from the other side of the aisle. Well, sometimes. The moon bats. Sometimes. Well, you do. You 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 tear them apart. <laughs> yeah, you, you you do you do it very well. Well, and you. more people need to do it. So we'll take our quick break now. We'll come back. We'll uh, do the last uh, 18 minutes or so of the show on this topic, I suspect, or who knows what else we'll talk about. This is, after all, Crock Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk. Brought to you by CNHT and, of course, the bloggers from GraniteRock.com. Check out what we do at GraniteRock.com. Lots of blogs, videos, audio. We do it all. W- WTF. 
WTF. Oh, yes. <laughs> WTF. And we will be in, I think we will almost entirely be in agreement about what the WTF and is. And laughingly in the week. so. And laughingly, <laughs> please deliver the news, sir. Yes, WMUR and the Hearst Corporation. Who we had dealings with in the past. <laughs> yes. When, when their First Amendment advocate said that I couldn't express my First Amendment rights, I thought that was just glorious. Go ahead. Show, you, you accuse me of trying to profit off your name with stuff that I'm handing out. Please, since I am a simpleton, according to some of my critics, send me a copy of one of those. Never heard back. But, but that's anyways, not the WTF. The WTF is that WMUR. You know, this is a small state, basically one and a half TV stations. Uh, MUR is still far uh, ahead of H one, yes. Instead of WBIN, has lost their presidential debate. Now they've always had Democrat pre- presidential the, debate. The Democrat one in this case. Um, why? Labor, labor <laughs> unions. WMUR, being the capitalists that they are, don't. Or, you know, they're in a, embroiled in a struggle with long, the IBEW. Long negotiations. Long negotiation. And they kind of went, the, the unions went to the um, Ray Buckley, who probably went to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the head of the. Well, Democrat and even National. possibly Maggie Hassan, who's received illegal contributions from the IBEW in her gov- yep. gubernatorial races. Yeah, and they have yanked the debate that was supposed to happen this coming Saturday away from WMUR. Now, supposedly, which is a lot like taking an infomercial off at one in the morning, by the way, because nobody's <laughs> going to be watching a debate on Saturday night. But well, please. well, that's part of the that's the the flip side of this. Are they still WTF. having the debate? Yeah. Yes, at St. Anselm's, and oh. WMUR said that they're still going to broadcast, uh, broadcast it. it. But oh, poor Josh McElvin. He's, he's lost his he's lost his seat at the big Jay. boy table as far as being a moderator, which you know I've posted before. He conspired with John King, uh, now of CNN, uh, last couple of cycles ago of trying to get uh, a food fight going. And they did it deliberately. And some of our good uh, activists heard them, and we posted the story on A that. debate food fight? A debate food Just fight. Just to clarify. Right. A Republican debate food fight? Correct. Okay, because they wouldn't do it to a Democrat. Uh, no, they don't seem to. And that's the whole point of DWS. Debbie Wasserman Schultz trying to keep these on Saturday nights when nobody's watching. Why? Protecting Hillary. They're watching the, reruns the, of Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's... It, it, it's it's, just, it's the WMUR-WTF. So, uh, I, I stand with WMUR on this one. You know, they're their employees. Granted, they probably can't get rid of them all and just hire non-union employees, but... Uh, they should consider it, <laughs> I think. Uh, clearly, the the union has proven to be detrimental to their profit model. Oh, absolutely. And so at that point, they're, what good are they? No, when you have employees openly advocating against the profit-making capability, trust me, folks, this was going to be a big profit center for them. Every presidential campaign season, it's that way for the local media. But this one especially is going to hurt. And, you know, who knows whether or not some pink slips will be sent out for Christmas instead of black lumps of coal. Which one is more politically incorrect? A pink slip, pink slip or, or a black, black coal? Black coal. <laughs> who knows nowadays? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have an answer to that question, please email skip at granitrock.com. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the, the, the government one. is probably going to mandate pink coal. Pink coal. Yes, or oh, green, code green pink, coal. Code pink coal. Maybe green coal. <laughs> green coal. Oh, well, they're already advocating that, which is no coal, by the way. <laughs> yeah. If you get coal in your stocking, the EPA is going to come and regulate you. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's a reason not to do that. Right. You know, and yes, you were going to say something. I was. I was going to say, you know, they seem to hide Hillary. And what does it say about the Democrat voters that that apparently they don't think they need any information about Hillary? And what does it say about their need to get independence and all these other people, the Republicans, keep getting told, they, oh, you need to get the independence, you get the normal amount of votes, all that stuff. It seems to me that Hillary expects only to get to vote from a certain set of people, and they're going to vote for whoever has a D next to the name. It could be Hillary, it could be uh, Jack the Ripper, it could be whatever. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering whether this is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy of keeping her away from the voters' stare because already we are now – in the last, what, month or so, starting to see some of the head-to-head polls against 
with Hillary against some of the Republican uh, want, non, uh, nominee wannabes, and she's losing. And the the rate of losing or the uh, the spread in the polls is getting larger and larger. So if they want to hide her, be my guest. Yes. Well, but she doesn't. When she gets more publicity, she does worse. Well, yeah. Well, pretty soon after the. Republicans have picked their nominee, whoever that is going to be. She's going to have to come front and center, and we'll, you know, I'd rather see it then. You know, the meltdown when people see her, they dislike her more. You know, I figure that that's one reason why Biden's is declared not to get in the race. They're waiting to see how well she's going to do. And April, May, if she's really doing terrible, she's going to be indicted. She'll have to fall, <laughs> and and Biden will have to step in and win the win the. Uh, Prince Biden. Win the nomination uh, and, and run for president. I, I, I he's such know. a good old guy. Uh, well, he may be a good old guy, but, you know, I've gotten to the point where I don't think the Democrats have any shame at all. Cause they have no the, shame. Here in the Obama administration, you guys probably saw the story where this 240-pound nurse at the VA beat the beat a, a, a 70-year-old vet to death, and he's still employed. Well, did he get a bonus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some he, of the other WTS I mean, we he, haven't hands, mentioned. Hands-on treatment of him. Yeah. Well, yeah, clearly, clearly, this is a dangerous job, and, and this person needs, you know. Everybody else in the VA got a got a bonus. In uh, any in any normal form of nursing, you'd be suspended without pay just for looking at the patients the wrong way. Never mind beating them to death. Yeah, you know, a friend but, of ours is is a nursing assistant in a in an old folks' home, and. Uh, you know they're they're very very strict and she's very good but she's occasionally she, shall we say a little outspoken uh, and it was she's been probably, suspended for such things. It was probably a case of self defense because the guy held a gun fifty years be earlier. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That was a trigger warning. Ooh. You know. It was a oh, threat. You just had to get around to that, didn't you? I, yeah, I did have to get around to it. Uh, oh dear, oh dear. I'm not going to let it slide. Yeah, well, you know, the butt's on you, I guess. All right, enough of that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, another WTF. All right. Uh, John Kerry, I posted up last night, uh, got caught by uh, junk science. Kerry, Kerry, quite contrary. Lurch. Or as Howie Carr calls him, live shot. Live shot. <laughs> uh, and not for his trigger capability no, either, even no. if he's wearing his magic hat. Uh he he basically let the cat out of the bag that this is not about um, energy. This is not about saving the planet. This is about telling the private sector that government's going to tell you what to do and in no uncertain terms. Well, it's, didn't we post something like a week or two ago that said that somebody admitted that this was compl- about realigning how an econ- the world economy works? Oh, yeah. The you UN know. said that plenty of times. Which, which basically means that uh, the U.S. is going to get hollowed out, all the heavy industry is going to be elsewhere, and it's going to be in places where it's going to ge- generate more pollution. Yeah. We already see this in China. Uh, Vietnam simply isn't far enough economically developed yet to be a pollution pollution hellhole, but it will be, uh, and, and many other places. Uh, be, because these will be places that are favored uh, under the redistribution of wealth uh, points of view of the UN experts. And so uh, eventually we'll be left with a, as a service economy uh, somehow it, providing, ins- providing insurance and serving McDonald's to the rest could, of the world. We could easily sell clean technology. Clean coal burning technology, clean energy technology to these countries instead of just giving them cash that they're going to waste, you know, like in Africa. And then we could – everybody, everybody could have clean, cheap energy. Everybody could have it. They could all burn coal cleaner, including China and India. But no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to let people profit in the coal industry on selling clean technology. We're going to make it cost more, and we're going to crush America in the process, which means, as you pointed out, it has nothing to do with coal, and it has nothing to do with energy or the climate. Right. I mean, as long as you're not going down the road of the government's going to dictate what clean coal technology is, because no, no, no. If, if you set reasonable limits on particulates, the hell with carbon dioxide, it's a natural gas, and uh, it makes the plants grow. If you set reasonable limit on things like particulates, mercury, sulfur, which do matter, and our industry is able to meet it, and it has, 
And we then say to China, look, our air's clean and yours isn't. Wouldn't you like to, to take advantage of that so your people don't choke and die on the streets of Beijing? Yeah, no, they well, don't well, they, they 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 don't care, but eventually they do because the same reason as I think it's Rush Limbaugh says frequently about uh, about capitalism. Uh, how is it that capitalism is painted as being so mean and not caring? Uh, you know, do they do you think they want to kill their customers? <laughs> Obviously not. Well, that's what the Marxists and the liberals, progressives, basically say that capitalists do want to do exactly that. We've heard yeah. that o- over and over again. Sure. In, in, it is in, yeah. historical fact that richer companies are better environmentally, and because you look and at all these people. poor, right? You look at all these poor, undeveloped countries, and you look at China. It, even though it is gaining in economic <clears throat> capability, right. it's still a nation of poor people. Right. And uh, yeah. you look at India. India is saying, "Give us the money from the United States." Why? They're not going to hamstring themselves because they rightfully, the other nations are rightfully saying, either we're going to put it in our own pockets, you know, as the head of state, like I posted last night at Venezuela, or they want to raise the standard of living of their citizens. You can't do that without energy. And yet here we go with the, the elites and the watermelon environmentalists saying we're not going to use energy. They're okay with a lower standard of living for Americans. And we ought to take them out, if I could borrow a phrase from Mike, the militant, go out and shoot them. There. <laughs> Have I done a trigger warning there? You know, but if effectively, this is what's happening. It's not just big countries, yeah. companies either. We had our little uh, company lunch the other day, and we were talking about odds and ends after lunch. And I was saying that one of our, one of our largest customers um, – and, of course, we sell rugged computers, and no matter how rugged you make them, the people who use them still find a way to bust them. So they come back for repair. And uh, we have a nice double-walled carton, cardboard carton that we use that we put them in with two foam ears. And those foam ears will last forever if you don't throw them out. So uh, for the last 18 months, I've been sticking a little piece of paper in there that says, please don't discard, please ship product in this container with these ears. And uh, they're being our largest customer right now, um, they have a lot of repairs. So uh, when they send it back in that foam, it saves us money because I don't have to send it out again in new foam. And it's good for the environment. I'm not doing it because it's good for the environment. I'm doing it because it saves us money. Right. And that's capitalism. It saves us money, but it's also good for the environment because we've created something that's reusable almost indefinitely that we will use indefinitely if you allow us to yeah. because we save money doing it. And, and, and ultimately, it's only limited by storage space, how how long it gets retained until it's right, recycled. Right, and we keep it out of the landfill. We do. It's styrofoam. It is styrofoam, but it's reusable. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of times reusable. Yeah. But, but, but see, that's know, the capital. Even, even then, uh, you know, the, 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 the liberals talk about styrofoam cups, uh, and it turns out that – uh, even styrofoam cups aren't that bad for the landfills. It was all a big hoax in the first place. Yeah, But see, Steve, you're making the case from the capitalist standpoint, it saves money. I'm fine with saving money, but it's the environmentals that want to switch it the other way. They don't care whether it saves you money or not because it makes them feel good. I know. I know. Yeah. And, and, I'm just and that's the problem with what they're doing to coal and electricity in this country. And that's what Kelly Ayotte is doing to us because first she votes for that <laughs> – "Quote unquote efficiency raising standard for like yeah. kitchen appliances. It doesn't matter that the dishwashers aren't going to be able to wash your dishes. They'll just use less electricity. Yeah, moron. It's going to have to run a whole lot longer. And now with her uh, support of Obama's Obama. clean power plan, it's going to cost us more for electricity to run something." You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, this will save you money, but it's going to cost you more up front, but it'll save you money in the long term. And then basically raise the, what no, that, lo- that, long, <laughs> that long-term cost when you're raising that. You know that you're thing we said about saving money? No, forget that. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 this is all about control. That's really what it mm-hmm. comes down to in almost every single endeavor of human life. It is people who just cannot help themselves. They have to be, control other people's lives. I am that, altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Then I think that's almost the best end to the show. Yeah, no, we it, still it, have another minute. It, uh, but that's exactly uh, exactly the nature of the problem. And, you know, I, 
look look at what what we're doing with this. You know, I got a, I got a way to solve some of the Islamic terror problems and. Uh, and Can you solve them in less than a minute? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hurry up. So you bomb the <laughs> out of uh, out of ISIS and especially out of their refineries, thereby raising the cost of oil in the Middle East. Meanwhile, allowing our fracking producers to to create oil profitably. And the Senate just passed legislation allowing us to export oil for the first time in forty years since Jimmy Carter messed it up. So the world market is a free market. It's you know, oil, oil, like any other commodity, is fungible. We don't care where you make, where you generate it, as long as people can buy it, and so it will flow more freely. The prices will tend to level out better. But meanwhile, if we destroy the sources of revenue for the bad guys in the Middle East, we can produce more of it, and uh, that's good for our currency. It's good for our country. <laughs> it's it's good for uh, it's good for our uh, you know U.S. companies. Nice job, and you that's got that why all the liberals there. are against it. Yes. And that's, All right. That's why Obama won't bomb the oil tankers that are making money for uh, the Turkish prime minister's son. All right. I got to turn you off because we're done. We're out of here. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. It's another week of Grok Talk. We will be back next week, and we'll remind you when we won't be. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GreenwichGrok.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. In accordance with Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, some of the material in this program is used under the fair use provision of federal copyright law. Sound effects were either created by the producers of the program, found free in the public domain, or are covered under Attribution 3.0. Most of the music on this program comes courtesy of Creative Commons licensing from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk.